basically I'll start off sort of why we kind of might want a dual EPR and NMR detection in our DNP spectrometer. So uh, DNP is a very powerful tool that can help solve the intrinsic sensitivity issue of NMR by transferring the large uh, electron polarization to the nuclei. But um, the DNP process involves not only nuclear to nuclear interactions, but also electron to nuclear and electron to electron interactions. And so to understand and optimize this DNP process, um, we need to be able to look at both the electrons and the nuclei, as well as their interactions and dynamics. So some things we might want to measure that affect the DMP process include uh, both the electron and the nuclear relaxation times, um, the electron to electron couplings, um, the electron G anisotropy, which is basically the equivalent of the, the chemical shift anisotropy of the electron, and the electron spin diffusion. And so most of these things you can't actually measure with just an NMR spectrometer. So to measure all the electron and nuclear properties involved in dynamic nuclear polarization at the correct DNP condition, uh, we do need a dual EPR and DNP spectrometer. And so a uh, typical high field, which is at our field is seven Tesla, which we consider high field. Uh, so it's typical high field dual EPR and DNP spectrometer consists of uh, four main parts. Uh, the magnet, obviously, which you need for any magnetic resonance experiment. Um, the cryostat, which allows us allows the low temperature conditions that we need for most uh, types of DNP experiments. Um, the dual EPR and NMR probe, which holds the sample and can pick, pick up the um, RF and microwave signals that come from the electrons and the, or the nuclei and the electrons respectively. And finally, we need the uh, RF and microwave electronics necessary to excite and detect our subsequent spin signals um, from the probe. So today in the first part of my talk, I'm going to be talking about how we do um, both EPR and NMR detection with these uh, radio frequency and microwave electronics um, and how we detect the, uh, the spin signals, essentially. And in the second part of my talk, I'll talk a little bit about the probe that we've built in our lab and kind of some of the design philosophies that behind that. Um, but so I'll start with the first part. And so in general, in like a general pulsed magnetic resonance experiment, the spins um, are excited um, with a radio frequency or microwave pulse at the Larmor frequency, be it the electron Larmor frequency or for EPR or the nuclear Larmor frequency for NMR here. And they give off an FID oscillating at the Larmor frequency, which I've kind of illustrated as this spin echo here. So the simplest detection scheme would be to directly digitize the FID um, at the Larmor frequency. Um, using some analog to digital converter. And so an analog to digital converter is basically a device that measures an analog voltage um, at discrete time points and converts it into a digital signal. Um, and so if we can basically do this process fast enough, uh, we can capture high frequency waveforms, um, like for example, an FID. And so this is essentially what an oscilloscope does. And I've kind of tried to illustrate that over here where we kind of are sampling the, um, the signal at discrete time points. And so for NMR frequencies, like um, uh, for example, at seven Tesla, it's about 300 megahertz. Um, directly digitizing this 300 megahertz signal, which is at the Lamar frequency is technically possible, but it's, uh, it's really difficult. So our analog to digital converter or ADC would need to take over 600 million samples every second to properly look at the signal. And you'd normally want even more than that due to the, um, the Nyquist limit. And so uh, this is possible, but it's often very expensive and comes with some drawbacks uh, such as increased noise of the ADC and less dynamic range. And so dynamic range essentially refers to the ability of this um, this device to capture both big and small signals at the same time, which can be important in a lot of NMR um, experiments. And so additionally, this would mean if we wanted to capture an FID, which is 10 milliseconds long, which is pretty typical for a, an NMR experiment, we need to take over 6 million points in this FID, which again is possible, but it's, it's very inconvenient to do, and it's very inconvenient to deal with for uh, processing. So um, at high field EPR frequencies, and so at our frequency, it's 200 gigahertz, 
we would need to sample at over 400 billion samples per second um, to digitize this FID. And so um, that's basically impossible. I don't think there's anything in the world that can do that. Um, so we need another way to do this. So um, typically in an NMR experiment, the data collect we collect is in, I guess, the rotating frame. And you could, is, a, is one way to think about it. And so basically the FID that we collect is oscillating at a small offset frequency, which is typically given in PPM rather than directly at the directly being modulated at the, uh, or oscillating at the nuclear Larmor frequency. And so I've kind of shown a typical NMR experiment over here on the left. And um, on the right, I've shown a typical EPR uh, solid echo experiment that we've done. And so if you look at the time axis of both of these experiments, you can see that these things are not oscillating at the Larmor frequency. So on the left, that would be about 294 megahertz. And on the right for the EPR experiment, that would be 194 gigahertz. Um, and this is because uh, typically the high frequency FID that we that comes out of our probe is converted to a lower frequency or uh, the rotating frame in the NMR spectrometer hardware before um, we collect the data in our analog to digital converter. Um, so to convert the high frequency FID uh, to a lower frequency, which we call is referred to as down conversion, we can use a device called an RF mixer. And so this is a three port device with two inputs and one output. And so I've shown this over here on the left-hand side. Um, the two inputs are called the LO here and the RF here. Um, the RF stands for radio frequency, and this is the port for the um, variable input signal, such as our FID. Um, the LO port here um, is, called, is called the local oscillator. And this is the port for a stable reference frequency to essentially mix our RF signal with. Um, and so this mixer will essentially um, output the sum and the difference frequency of these two input frequencies. Um, for example, if we had our FID oscillating at 300 megahertz and we mixed it with a, just another input signal of three megahertz on our LO port, at the output, we get a, we get a signal at zero megahertz and at 600 megahertz. Um, additionally, besides these two outputs, the mixers will also output various harmonics, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so the simplest way we can use these mixers in what's is in what's called a homode homodyne detection scheme. Um, so in this word, homo basically means the same and dyne meaning means like to mix or something. And so it basically means that we're mixing two frequencies which are the same. Um, so in this setup, we take the FID and we mix it again with, um, with a signal that's at roughly the, the Larmor frequency um, in the mixer. And on the output of the mixer, we'll get some FID that's basically modulated at zero hertz. So it's not oscillating. It's no longer oscillating at the nuclear or electron Larmor frequency. It basically only contains information about the offset in PPM and the um, your re basically your re relaxation, T2 relaxation. Um, However, in order to properly process an EPR NMR spectra, we know that we actually need phase information. And basically this means that we need the real and imaginary component of our FID. And that would look something like this up here. Um, and so we can add phase sensitivity to our homodyne detection setup by switching our, our normal RF mixer, which I just described with an IQ or a quadrature mixer. And so an IQ mixer uh, splits the incoming RF signal into two components that are 90 degrees phase shifted from each other. And so um, the reason it can do this is because this IQ mixer is actually two separate mixers, as illustrated over here, um, that are receiving a LO or a local oscillator signal that is 90 degrees phase shifted from each other. So basically, we put in our LO and it's split into two signals that are 90 degrees phase shifted that goes into each mixer. And it turns out that when we add or subtract frequencies in our mixer, we also add or subtract their phase. And so we use this property to get at the output of the, each of these mixers um, a signal that's 90 degrees phase shifted from each other. 
Um, so that's how we collect the real and imaginary portion of our um, NMR spectra generally. Um, however, it turns out that this homodyne detection scheme is actually not the most sensitive um, or best way to receive our signal or our FID. And so um, something called a super heterodyne receiver setup actually will give us better signal to noise. Um, and I guess the word in the word super heterodyne, hetero means different. So we're mixing different frequencies instead of the same. And super in this case means, I think, multiple. So I think it means something like we're mixing multiple frequencies multiple times. Um, but I won't worry too much about the, uh, the etymology of the word. Um, so in the super heterodyne scheme, we first convert our FID. So we have our FID and we first convert that to some lower frequency, um, but not quite yet to convert it to a zero frequency like we do in the homodyne detection. And so this lower frequency that we first convert it to is called the intermediate frequency or IF. And this can typically be from tens of megahertz to a few gigahertz. And so an example of something that actually also uses a super heterodyne detection scheme is an FM radio. And so FM radio generally operates around 100 megahertz, but they, they use an IF or intermediate frequency stage of 10.7 megahertz um, in their um, super heterodyne detection scheme. So um, we actually do most of our signal processing in the intermediate frequency. And this is mostly filtering and amplification that I'll go over a little bit later before we, uh, before we mix down to our final zero frequency in an IQ mixer. And so there's, there's a number of reasons why this is more sensitive than a um, homodyne detector. But one of the big ones is that this IQ demodulation is less noisy and it's easier to build an accurate IQ mixer at uh, lower frequencies, um, especially with respect to the getting proper phases into this mixer. Um, so now that we roughly know how super heterodyne detection works, hopefully, um, I'll kind of walk through the parts of a typical super heterodyne um, magnetic resonance spectrometer. And so this could be, this is pretty general for both EPR and NMR. Um, so this spectrometer can be separated into two parts. Uh, we have the transmit stage and we have the receive stage. Um, the transmit stage is responsible for sending excitation pulse sequences to the probe, while the receive stage is responsible for detecting the um, FID or signal that the spins give out um, from the probe. Um, so the first part of the transmit stage is our RF synthesizer here. And so this component essentially generates a continuous uh, wave or CW output frequency that's at our uh, LARMAR frequency. Um, some types of this include uh, YIG oscillators, which stands for yttrium iron garnet, uh, which are very good at microwave frequencies, but are pretty expensive. Um, another type is uh, voltage controlled oscillators with phase lock loops, which can work up to 10 gigahertz and are pretty cheap nowadays, but um, they tend to be lower quality. Um, and a little bit less stable. And then finally, we have uh, direct digital synthesizers. And so uh, the most prominent type of these synthesizers for modern NMR, for example, is the uh, direct digital synthesizer due to its ability to arbitrarily change frequency or phase. And so if we use one of these as our synthesizer, we already have the ability to change our fa uh, to change phase during a pulse sequence. And so essentially what a direct digital synthesizer is, is an analog or a digital to analog converter, which is kind of the opposite of an analog to digital converter that can output a voltage at periodic time points, kind of like I've illustrated here. And if we can do this fast enough, we can kind of construct a sine wave that can be used as a frequency source for our synthesizer. Um, so the next component in our transmit stage is um, a pulse forming switch, which essentially chops out pulses from this um, CW input frequency here. Um, and these switches are generally controlled by logic signals from our computer, uh, from a FPGA or a microcontroller timing unit, which are basically uh, delay generators. Um, and generally these, these switches are constructed out of um, some configuration of pin diodes, but I won't really go too much into that. And so here are some examples of what um, some commercially available switches might uh, look like. 
Um, in addition to this pulse forming switch, there can be a phase selector switch for if we want to modulate the phase of our pulses very quickly during a pulse sequence. Um, this essentially is a multiple port switch, as shown here, that can select from multiple different fixed phase shifters. Um, so by selecting a different pathway for the pulse, it will select what phase the pulse is. Um, and these, these fixed phase shifters can be basically as simple as um, different lengths of transmission line or coax cables with, um, varying, um, with varying length. And so for every basically quarter wavelength of um, transmission line, uh, you'll get a 90 degree phase shift. Um, and so that's one way to modulate uh, your phase. Um, and then so the output of these phase shifters are then combined back into this um, combiner or combined back into the main signal path using this combiner or basically another switch. Um, and so um, in a Bruker spectrometer, this thing is called a four phase modulator, um, which you might recognize. And so um, after, after we potentially have phase modulation, the next thing we have is our variable gain stage. And so this is where the final pulse power is controlled. So basically where the nutation frequency of your pulse is controlled. And so in most cases, um, this consists of a variable attenuator, which um, followed by a fixed gain power amplifier. And so this variable, the job of this variable attenuator is basically to decrease, to decrease the amplitude of the pulse um, by a variable amount that you can set before it's amplified by a fixed amount by this power amplifier. And generally this attenuator and power amplifier are calibrated together so that for a, for a known value of attenuation at your attenuator, you'll get a known um, output power at the output of your power amplifier. So after the power amplifier, we have what's called a TR switch. Um, or duplexer, uh, TR stands for um, transmit or is and receive. And so this device essentially directs um, our high power excitation pulses from our power amplifier um, into the probe, but it prevents um, these high power pulses from going to our, the receiver section of our circuit and like essentially blowing it up. And um, it also directs the, um, the signals from our the small signals from our probe into the receiver portion of our probe and not back into the power amplifier. And so um, there's a few ways there's a there's a lot of ways you can kind of construct this device. This is kind of a general term for a lot of devices, different devices. Uh, but in NMR, uh, this device is generally constructed constructed out of some arrangement of cross diodes or an active pin diode switch. And so um, this design kind of down here was one of the first designs that people used for pulsed NMR as a TR switch. Um, and it works pretty well at low frequencies, but I think it starts to, it starts to be less good at high frequencies. Um, so they've switched to different designs now, but just to give you guys a sense of what that might look like. Um, in X and Q band EPR, the TR switch is generally a ferromagnetic device called a circulator that um, essentially directs the microwave signal in one direction. And so I've shown that here. So um, basically it directs the signal from port one to port two and from port two to port three, but it prevents the signal from going backwards from port th uh, three to port two and from port two to port one. And that's how it protects the um, receiver from um, high power transmit pulses. Um, in high, field, in high field EPR, so like over 100 gigahertz, which is the field that we're at, so we're at 200 gigahertz, uh, most of the time we use a, a quasi-optical isolator that's based on Faraday rotators and wire grids. And I'll talk about that a bit more, um, a bit later in this talk. So now that we've directed our pulse into our probe and have received the um, FID or our spin signal from the TR switch, which I've tried to illustrate here. Um, however, the signal from the probe is usually pretty noisy and I've tried to kind of illustrate that there as well. Um, and this noise is generally due to thermal noise from the resistance of the probe components, the TR switch components and the coaxial lines, if 
if the probe and is is properly designed that is um and so this thermal noise, uh, thermal noise voltage is given by this equation up here. Um, and basically signal to noise is scaled down as this thermal noise voltage gets bigger. Um, and so we can see that the R in this equation stands for resistance. And so that essentially is the resistance of um, our probe and our TR switch and um, the coaxial lines that connects everything. Um, and so another factor in this equation is delta F. And so this basically refers to the frequency bandwidth of the noise, because this noise is broadband. Um, and because this noise is broadband, which means that it's at all frequencies, um, we can limit this overall noise voltage here by decreasing this delta F, or decreasing the bandwidth uh, at which this noise happens. And we can do this by filtering out all the other um, frequencies besides the nuclear Lamar frequency. Um, so we do that using a bandpass filter to only allow, which is basically a device that only allows certain frequencies through. And so we only allow our Lamar frequency through and we block um, every other frequency, which uh, will include the thermal noise at those frequencies as well. And so uh, for NMR frequencies, we can generally use the lumped element filter, that, which basically means lumped element basically means that it's constructed of inductors and capacitors. And so that might look something like this here. Um, this is like a typical um, bandpass circuit design. Um, for microwave frequencies, which uh, with a wavelength is a lot smaller. Um, generally, we need to use strip line or transmission line based filters because it's really hard to build these discrete capacitors and inductors like we do here. And so uh, a strip line or transmission line based filter for X band might look something like this down here. And there's other types of filters as well, such as ceramic filters, um, cavity filters, which are sometimes used at even higher frequencies, and uh, surface acoustic wave filters, but I won't really go into those right now. So after we filter out um, our kind of noisy FID from the probe, we should have something that's a little bit cleaner. Um, however, it's still very small in amplitude. And so generally, we want to amplify that to um, a higher amplitude so it can be more immune to noise using something called a low noise amplifier or a preamplifier. And so it turns out that it's uh, critical that the noise figure, which basically means the amount that the preamplifier degrades the signal to noise of our signal, um, if, so basically the noise figure of this LNA or low noise amplifier needs to be as small as possible. And this is because of this thing called the Friss equation uh, here. Uh, and basically what it says is that all the noise added after an amplifier uh, degrades the signal to noise ratio much less than all of the noise added um, in all the components up to and including the amplifier. And so you can kind of see that the effect of that down here in this equation. And so um, basically what this means is that pretty much the, the, the total noise of your setup um, will be determined by the probe, the TR switch, this filter, and the low noise amplifier here. Um, and to give you an idea of like what this might look like, uh, a, a, a well-designed NMR spectrometer, I think, typically has a noise figure of, of 2 dB or decibels or less. And basically, this means that all of these components degrade the signal to noise by 25% um, or less, essentially. So uh, once we ensure a high signal to noise, once we kind of lock in that signal to noise figure with this amplifier or low noise amplifier, we can do the first down conversion step of our super heterodyne detection. And so um, we down convert our signal from the nuclear MAR frequency. So we have our FID at the nuclear MAR frequency here um, to our intermediate frequency. And so in some Bruker spectrometers, this intermediate frequency is, for example, 22 megahertz. Um, so to down convert to our intermediate frequency, we use another frequency synthesizer that is offset from the LARMAR frequency by um, the IF frequency. So it can basically be, be the LARMAR frequency plus or minus the IF frequency. Um, 
And so, um, for example, if all, our Larmor frequency was 300 megahertz, which I'm showing here, and our um, and our IF is 20, if we want to be 22 megahertz, we could put in something like 322 megahertz. And so we'd use the difference between these signals to get our output of 22 megahertz. Um, and so at the output of our mixer, we then have our FID and signal, which is modulated at both the sum and difference frequency, uh, both 22 and 622 megahertz, for example, as well as some um, harmonics. Uh, so after our mixer, we have our intermediate or IF frequency um, and the sum of our LO and RF frequency. And like I said, uh, a lot of harmonics that are unavoid unavoidably generated in a real mixer. And so over here on the right, I've shown a figure um, that uh, shows some of the harmonics that can be generated from an uh, RF of 300 megahertz and an LO or local oscillator of 322 megahertz. And you can see that this x-axis here is frequency and this y-axis is intensity. So it's showing the intensity of all these different frequency harmonics. And so you can see um, that we have, a bunch of, we have a bunch of them in here now, a bunch of these frequencies in here now that we don't want. And so we, basic, we need to use another bandpass filter to select basically only the frequency we want, which is generally this lowest frequency here. Um, and so after this filter, hopefully we then have a clean signal that's modulated only at our intermediate frequency. So after filtering our intermediate frequency signal, we can then amplify it with a, some variable gain amplifier so we can get our signal into the correct dynamic range of our ADC. So essentially amplify it so it's easier to look at. And this amplifier is generally what sets uh, the receiver gain of your spectrometer. And so um, one reason why we like to do this amplification at this intermediate frequency um, is because these am amplifiers generally have a higher gain at lower frequencies. So it's a lot easier to do this than it is at higher frequencies. Um, but uh, it's better to do it at an intermediate frequency rather than zero frequency down here because typically amplification at zero frequency is more noisy. So um, the amplified signal is then sent from our uh, variable amplifier to our IQ mixer for the final phase sensitive down conversion. And I'll note that the, um, the local oscillator input for this IQ mixer is generally generated using a combination of our initial um, transmission uh, frequency, as well as the um, as well as this local oscillator frequency that we generated for down converting to our IF frequency. And so, um, basically, the difference between these two frequencies will also be the intermediate frequency. And so, when we mix the intermediate frequency with our signal, which is at the intermediate frequency, we get our signal down to zero frequency. So that's how that works. Um, so we can actually, or if you guys have a Bruker spectrometer, you might recognize um, some of these names. So I've organized kind of the parts of a typical Bruker spectrometer um, uh, by these uh, by function essentially. So you can see that the FCU and the PTS, which are these things here, those these combine to form your frequency synthesizer. Um, the FCU is actually a direct digital synthesizer, but it's at a lower frequency. Um, the ASU is the amplitude setting unit, and that contains the um, the pulse forming the pulse forming switches and this um, and this variable attenuator as well. Uh, the BLA X or H, which stands for Bruker Linear Amplifier uh, for the H or X channel, is our power amplifiers. Um, HPPR stands for High Power Preamplifier. And so this contain this generally contains the TR switch, all the filters that they use, and some um, low noise amplifier or, pre or the actual preamplifier. Uh, LOT stands for a local oscillator and tune. So this is that's why they call it LO is because it's feeding the LO of these mixers. And RX22, um, which stands basically receiver at 22 megahertz. So this 22 basically refers to the intermediate frequency that they use. And then finally, we have this SADC and HADC. And so the ADC here stands basically for analog to digital converter. 
Um, so now that we kind of know how maybe um, an NMR spectrometer or just more general spectrometer works, I want to talk about a little bit how our home-built EPR spectrometer works specifically, because ours works, we have like a few interesting features for ours. Um, so our home-built 200 gigahertz pulsed EPR spectrometer um, has, is, is pretty similar. So we both, we still have these transmit stages and we still have these receive stages and many of the components are the same. However, like I said, there are some differences. So uh, the first difference is, is that our pulses, um, our pulse sequences are formed at X band rather than directly at the Larmar frequency, which for our case would be 200 gigahertz. And so we do this because it's much easier to do this signal processing and to generate these pulses at this lower frequency than it would be to try to generate this at the 200 gigahertz, which is a really, really high frequency. And so uh, we generate this, uh, this initial 12, around 12 gigahertz signal using, our, using a YIG oscillator, which I mentioned before, so yttrium iron garnet. Um, and these devices are basically made from ferrite materials that resonate at a microwave frequency when you uh, put them in a magnetic field. And so you can kind of tune the frequency by changing the magnetic field a little bit. Um, and so the, we generate our, our, um, our signal at our initial signal at 12 gigahertz. But another difference in our transmit stage is the presence of this IQ mixer and this arbitrary waveform generator here. And so an arbitrary waveform generator is basically a digital to analog converter similar to a direct digital synthesizer, which I mentioned earlier, that can output um, arbitrary time varying signals. And so basically for our purposes, what we use it for is we can generate signals that vary in frequency and phase over time. And so that might look like something like these signals here. Um, and so we can actually inject these time varying um, frequencies into our main 12 gigahertz frequency using this uh, IQ mixer. And so here, this IQ mixer is in the reverse configuration of when we use it to do phase sensitive down conversion. Um, so instead of using the I and the Q ports here, which are the two output ports as um, outputs, we use them actually, we use the I and Q ports as uh, inputs for our AWG signal. And so these I and Q signals will then mix with the 12 gigahertz signal from our frequency synthesizer, um, which is input at the uh, LO or local oscillator port to produce a signal with some time varying offset frequency at the output. So basically a 12 gigahertz signal that's like plus, plus or minus the, um, the frequency that you inject in. Um, and in this case, we actually need to use an IQ mixer rather than a normal mixer. Uh, because if we use a normal mixer, um, we'll get both the sum and the difference of, the, of these two um, it inputs at our output. And so that would look something like this over here on the right. So if our um, so if our LO is 12 gigahertz, which is this blue, and our IF is one gigahertz, and we're trying to inject this one gigahertz signal into our 12 gigahertz signal, we'll get both um, 13 gigahertz and 11 gigahertz. And so um, it turns out that using the IQ mixer, we can eliminate one of either the 11 gigahertz or the 13 gigahertz signal. Um, if these I and Q inputs are 90 degrees phase shifted from each other. And so um, if basically they have to be the same waveform, but essentially just 90 degrees phase shifted. And so I've tried to illustrate that with both of these, these waveforms, for example, would be 90 degrees phase shifted for each other. Um, and the way this works out in the mixer, it just cancels out one of these, um, one of either the sum or difference frequencies. And so using this technique, we can quickly modulate the frequency and phase of our signal with the only limitation being pretty much the speed of our AWG. And so for our purposes, we use this an AWG that looks like this right here. And the advantage of this is that our, our YIG synthesizers can take pretty long to change uh, frequency um, and they can't really change phase. But using our AWG, we can change our frequency almost as fast as we want. And we can also change our phase pretty much in, almost instantaneously. And we're only limited by the speed of this AWG here. 
So after our AWG um, modulation that we use with the IQ mixer, uh, our 12 gigahertz signal is then sent to what's called an amplifier multiplier chain or AMC for short. And so this is a device kind of similar to a mixer in which it can chain, it can shift the frequency of a signal. Um, but instead of mixers, it uses these things called multipliers. And so a multiplier is some nonlinear device that can generate uh, harmonics of its own frequency. Um, and we can use those frequencies, uh, and those frequencies are at multiples of the original frequency, and we can use those frequencies to um, get as basically the higher frequency. For example, in a doubler, in a doubler, we'll basically take the second harmonic of our initial frequency. Um, so these harmonics are then filtered and amplified. And we you generally do this a few times. So basically multiply our frequency, filter out all the unwanted harmonics, amplify it, and then multiply it again, and uh, rinse and repeat. And so we do that until the final multiplication factor is reached. Um, and for our case, we want to multiply by 16 times. So 12 gigahertz times 16 is roughly 192 gigahertz, which is roughly what we want. Um, and in general, more advanced uh, amplifier multiplier chains will have better amplifiers at the higher frequencies. Um, for example, after the last or second to last uh, doubler, for example. Um, and so these amplifier multiplier chains will output this high frequency, which is for us at 192 gigahertz, um, into a waveguide, which you can, and so this is kind of a picture of our amplifier multiplier chain. So we'll output it into a waveguide, which is kind of down here which will then launch um, this high frequency as a Gaussian beam into uh, our quasi optics or into free space via this corrugated horn antenna here. Um, so um, the Gaussian beam from our amplifier multiplier chain, and we actually have two of them on our, um, on our system because we have two separate um, transmit channels. Um, so this, this beam is launched into our quasi optics and it's basically, basically a Gaussian beam is kind of like a laser beam, but at much lower frequencies. And so we can essentially use things like optics, but we use, we call them quasi optics because they happen at, they also happen at a much lower frequency and much higher wavelength. Um, so the, the purpose of our quasi optics here, as I mentioned earlier, is to act as a TR switch or duplexer at really high frequencies. And I won't go into too much detail here because I think I'll run out of time. But um, essentially what these quasi optics can do is they can combine and separate multiple transmit and receive beams using the polarization of these beams. Uh, and so it uses basically, it can rotate and filter the polarization of different beams to um, separate and combine them together. And so here kind of with these arrows I've shown um, the path in our system of the Gaussian beams in our quasi optics. And I've also written on there the polarization of, the, um, of these beams as they go through different components, but I'll uh, probably not talk too much about that. But um, Thorsten actually had a really nice talk on this. Um, and, and I think it's on the YouTube channel, actually. So if you're, if you're interested in quasi optics, I would, I would definitely recommend go checking, checking his talk out. Um, and so this, this is kind of just what our quasi optics looks like um, in reality. So it's basically this big uh, breadboard, essentially. And we have our amp two amplifier multiplier chains that you can kind of see here, as well as our uh, receiver system, which you can see here. And so um, we receive our signal in the form of a Gaussian beam via uh, another corrugated waveguide horn. And this corrugated waveguide horn will feed into what's called a subharmonic mixer. And so this mixer here is essentially our IF mixer from the, the previous example. However, instead of our LO or local oscillator um, being at some, being uh, at the Larmar frequency, plus or minus the um, intermediate or IF frequency, um, we use half of the normal frequency we would use. And so for example, our IF frequency here is three gigahertz um, and our RF frequency could be uh, 192 gigahertz. And so our, normally our LO would be 192 gigahertz plus or minus three gigahertz. 
But for a subband mixer, we can use something like 192 gigahertz plus or minus three gigahertz uh, divided by two. So basically our LO could be our RF plus IF div divided by two. Um, and so we, we can actually use the harmonics of the, um, of the sum and difference frequencies from the LO and the RF inputs here um, to get our uh, intermediate frequency. And so um, if we mix together our basically LO RF plus or minus IF over two, which in our case can be at 97.5 gigahertz with our signal, which is at let's say 192 gigahertz, then we'll get a bunch of frequencies that look like this down here. So this can be some of the output frequencies. And you can see that um, one of these output frequencies is actually at three gigahertz down here, which is the desired IF frequency, even though it's not the most um, intense signal that we get out of the mixer, we can still uh, select this to be our output. And so um, the reason why we do it this way is because it's much easier to generate a stable frequency for inputting to our LO in our mixer at a lower frequency than it is to, to do this at much higher frequency. And this especially is true in like the hundreds of gigahertz range that we're operating at, do this thing called the terahertz gap, which is essentially, for some reason in nature, it's harder to generate these um, hundreds of gigahertz frequencies than it is to generate even higher frequencies or lower frequencies. Um, and so after the, after the subband mixer, the rest of the intermediate frequency stage and receiver is pretty much the same. Um, I will, I will say that I did include this, um, protect switch in the diagram here. And so basically this switch will turn off. It will be disconnected during excitation, the excitation pulse sequence. And then for reception, it will turn on. And it does that basically just to protect this low noise amplifier here. And in general, a lot of breaker spectrometers will also have this, but I didn't, I didn't show it in the last example, but I'm showing it here. Um, and so that's, that's kind of the only difference that I've shown here. Um, I also want to note that the way that our local oscillator is generated for both our IF mixing and our final phase sensitive down conversion is slightly different. So instead of directly generating our alarm R frequency plus or minus the IF frequency, uh, for example, um, we generate we generate a frequency at about 12 gigahertz, which is the same at 12 gigahertz plus uh, 187.5 megahertz, which is essentially um, three gigahertz divided by 16. And so um, we do it here at this frequency, and then we use multipliers to multiply our um, our frequency up to our final um, frequency that we can use for the LO for our two. Uh, mixers here. And so uh, in summary, we have uh, basically a home-built EPR spectrometer that can do multi-frequency excitation based on our the ability of our quasi-optics to kind of duplex these beams together. Um, and it can also do detection at 200 gigahertz as well. And basically it operates almost pretty much identically to the Bruker NMR spectrometer, except um, there's, like I, like I highlighted, there's a few select key differences. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much the end of the first part of my talk. Um, and so, I, like I said, for the second part of my talk, I want to focus um, a little bit more on the, the dual EPR and DNP probe that we've developed and kind of some ideas about, about why, we, why we built it like we did. Um, so uh, switching gears a little bit, for a low temperature EPR and DNP probe, there are kind of three main aspects we need to consider, which are pretty much in the name. Um, the first aspect is the NMR detection and excitation. Um, and for our case, we wanted to have double resonance NMR detection. So we can kind of, we can transfer polarization between nuclei and see how, basically see how the polarization from DNP spreads out to different nuclei. Um, we also need EPR detection uh, and excitation. Um, for both EPR detection and DNP. And so in our case, we wanted a probe that can handle multi-frequency or broadband microwave radiation. And we want this because we like to do these pump probe experiments where we have, we pump at one electron frequency and probe at another electron frequency. 
And this experiment is shown here, and it's called uh, basically an Eldor experiment. Oh. Um, and finally, we need to also consider um, the temperature performance of our probe. So basically, how low in temperature can we go and how stable is it, uh, stuff like that. Uh, but for today, I'm going to mostly focus on the, the NMR and EPR detection aspects of this probe. Uh, so a typical NMR probe consists of, which I've shown over here on the left, uh, consists of a resonant circuit made from capacitors and inductors and coaxial cables. And so the NMR sample is placed inside of a coil or inductor that's oriented perpendicular to the main magnetic field. And then the FID is detected through the induction of the spins in the coil. And so um, this setup is possible because the wavelength of the nuclear RMR frequency is typically very, very long compared to the size of our sample and compared to the size of typical inductors and capacitors. So for example, at 300 megahertz, our wavelength is, would be about one meter. Um, however, on the EPR side at the same exact field, for seven which is seven Tesla for us, the wavelength becomes one, about 1 1.5 millimeters here. And so for capacitors and inductors to behave as lumped elements, which basically means they behave exactly as capacitors and inductors, um, they would need to be much smaller than this wavelength, which is really hard to deal with. They have, if it has to be much smaller than 1.5 millimeters, that becomes really annoying to build. Um, and additionally, our coaxial cables would need to be much smaller to act as proper coaxial cables. And this would make them a lot less efficient and more lossy. Um, so instead of lumped elements and coaxial cables, we in instead use resonant cavities, waveguides, and quasi-optics, as I described earlier. And so a typical high-field probe will generally look something like this down here. So it will consist of a corrugated waveguide that accepts a Gaussian beam from the quasi-optics and then passes it to the sample here. And so this sample can be contained in some sort of resonator, or it can just be in some non-resonant structure that is transparent to microwaves. So for EPR and NMR, uh, for, for our EPR and NMR probe, there are kind of two main metrics that we want to optimize. And those are the signal to noise and the, um, the B1 or the nutation frequency, essentially. Um, we want to optimize the signal noise kind of it's obvious we want more signal noise, but um, we especially want more signal noise at low temperatures and under non MAS conditions because our probe is a non MAS probe. And this is because the um, the T2 of our spins under these conditions, it, uh, especially our NMR spins is very, very short. Um, and so we want higher signal to noise to kind of counteract that. Um, on the B1 side or mutation frequency side, for NMR, we want to maximize the B1 so that we can do, for example, high power proton decoupling, and so that we can do uh, efficient cross-polarization uh, transfer experiments. On the EPR side, we want to maximize B1 so basically we can get the most DMP enhancement we can because um, our amplifier multiplier chains are not gyrotrons, and we generally don't um, saturate the DNP transitions. So we generally can always use more power for getting more DNP. Um, additionally, we want a high B1 for EPR, so we can do sufficiently uh, hard pulses uh, for short T2 uh, for electrons, which have pretty short T2 sometimes. So essentially, we basically don't want our spins dephasing during a pulse, during like a 90 pulse. And so if the 90 pulse is too long, then our spins can dephase during it. And that's not as good for EPR detection. And um, so I've given the, the equations for signal or noise over here on the top left. Um, I will note that they're not like the full equation for signal or noise. Uh, you can find a lot. Um, you can find those equations in other papers. Uh, so one of them is down here by uh, Holt et al. Um, but um, they're pretty good. The, these equations contain pretty good metrics um, for judging the quality of a probe and kind of choosing how you want to build it. Uh, so I'll go through these equations and kind of tell you what the, each of these uh, each of these variables in here means. So the Q in both of these equations stands for quality factor. Um, 
And so there are a few definitions for Q, but it's essentially a measurement of how much energy is lost versus how much energy is stored in a circuit, like for example, a resonant circuit. And so a higher Q indicates a higher amount of energy stored. So for an NMR circuit, the Q is determined by a, basically the resistance of the components of the probe, uh, including the um, capacitors and inductors, uh, as well as any um, wires used to connect them together. And so uh, um, a higher Q will lead to both a higher signal to noise and B1, as you can kind of clearly see from these equations here. Um, so the Q of a circuit can actually be measured by the reflection parameter or the uh, tuning dip that you can typically get from a spectrometer or a vector network analyzer, as shown here kind of on the right. I've tried to illustrate this. And so the Q can be measured as a function of the resonant tuning um, dip, the bandwidth of this resonant tuning dip. Um, I will note that there's kind of two ways to define Q. One of them is when you measure the, the bandwidth of this dip at minus 3 dB, which is half, basically the full width half max, and one of the, which is denoted as QL generally. And one is where you define it as where you measure the bandwidth at minus 7 dB or decibels. And this is denoted as QT. And um, both of these are used, but it's, it's important to just keep track of which one you use because generally QT will be about two times QL. Um, so that's just kind of a, something I wanted to note. Um, so, but yeah, the takeaway is that higher Q and less resistance of your components can lead to um, higher signal noise and higher B1. Um, the next, the next uh, variable in this equation I want to go over is P, and this basically stands for the input power received by a matched probe. So it's basically the power accepted by your circuit. Um, so for a well-matched probe, this is equal to the power output from our amplifier. So that would be our power amplifier in, um, or in uh, NMR, essentially. Um, and so in NMR, the limiting factor for this, this P is how much um, power the components of your probe can handle. And so, for example, it's how much, pow uh, how much voltage or power your capacitors can handle or your inductors can handle or just it's essentially the overall geometry of your circuit. Uh, in our experience, we've generally found that capacitors are some of the first things to kind of give up when you uh, put too much power through them. Um, but um, it's also very possible that other components will, uh, will tend to arc as well. Um, also note that in, in liquids probes, uh, the input power can be uh, limited by sample heating effects. Um, it's not as relevant in like solid state probes, but so it can still happen. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, for, and on the EPR side, this, this P or the power is not limited by the power handling the components generally, because on the NMR side, you have these big beefy power amplifiers, which can output kilowatts of power, which is generally more than you would need. But on the EPR side, we have our amplifier multiplier chains, which can only output hundreds of milliwatts of power which is not really enough to cause arcing or to destroy any components. And so the input power is usually limited by how efficiently we can get the power from our amplifier multiplier chains to our sample. And so that's the reason why we use quasi optics because they have very low loss. And that's also the reason why you use these corrugated waveguides is because they also have very, very low loss. Um, so the next parameter is the sample filling factor. And so um, in an NMR experiment, the sample is placed inside of a sample coil or inductor. And the sample is, the spins are excited and detected by the magnetic field um, of, this, uh, of this inductor. However, not 100% of the magnetic field generated by the sample coil goes into the sample. And so I've tried to illustrate that kind of here. You can see that here's our coil. And we have our sample inside, and here is kind of a, a 2D cutout of the sample in the coil, as well as the magnetic field generated by this coil. And you can see that um, this coil is generating magnetic field kind of outside of itself and inside of itself that are not in the sample. And so these, these magnetic fields that are not overlapping the sample are essentially wasted. And so the filling factor kind of describes the percent of the magnetic field that's actually experienced by the sample itself. Um, 
And so the next parameter is a circuit filling factor. And so this concept is pretty similar to sample filling factor, but it applies it, it applies the concept to the entire circuit. So it's basically the percent of the total magnetic field in the circuit that's generated by the sample coil. So uh, for an ideal single resonance circuit, uh, the circuit filling factor would be one or 100% because we only have one, ideally we only have one inductor or coil, which is the sample inductor. Um, and this is the only inductor that's storing or generating a magnetic field. Uh, however, for a double resonance circuit, which is the circuit we're most interested in, the circuit filling factor is usually split between the two channels between, for example, if you have an H and an X channel. Um, and that's because an additional inductor needs to be added to have that second resonance, which will also generate a magnetic field that is not experienced by the sample. And so I've tried to kind of illustrate that in these simulations down here. So here you can kind of see our very simple double, this is probably the most simple double resonance circuit you could build. Um, and so uh, here I've illustrated the magnetic fields of the X channel. And you can see here that um, the, the most of the magnetic field is kind of generated inside of this auxiliary coil, which is not our sample coil because our sample is over here. And so this would essentially have a circuit filling factor qualitatively, you can say it's probably less than 0 0.5 because most of it is not in the sample coil. Um, however, on the H channel, you can kind of tell that most of this magnetic energy is generated by or stored in the sample coil. And so you can kind of say that this circuit filling factor is um, over 0 0.5. Uh, we'll note that additionally, um, magnetic field can be generated by these wires used to connect the components as well, um, because and since these wires generate magnetic field, they can also dilute your circuit filling factor. And so another, another way to think about circuit filling factor is the, um, the total energy in a given inductor is that the total energy in like a given inductor in this circuit or coil in this circuit is the sum of the energy of all the resonances that exist for that circuit. Um, so for example, if we take this, um, if we take an ideal double resonance circuit, the, uh, the X channel circuit filling factor would be the energy stored in the sample coil at the X frequency divided by the energy stored in the sample coil at the X and the H frequency combined. And so I'm trying to kind of show that down here. Um, and so practically, if that doesn't make too much sense, practically what that means is that a circuit with more resonances uh, we'll, we'll split the circuit filling factor between all the resonances. And so this is especially can have an adverse effect if more inductors or coils than necessary are used to create this double resonance circuit, uh, which will essentially lead to more resonances that aren't used. Uh, for example, if we had a double resonance circuit with three inductors, this could lead to three resonances when we only need two, which would be an unnecessary dilution of our circuit filling factor. Okay, so now that I've kind of gone through um, these the factors in the signal noise and B1 equation um, that we want to optimize, um, we have uh, we have some design choices that we wanted to make when choosing uh, how how to build our RF circuit for this uh, low temperature dual EPR DNP probe. And so, um, when choosing an RF circuit for use with a cryo probe, one one major decision is whether to put the uh, tuning and matching elements, which are generally variable capacitors like this here, whether to put those um, inside or outside the cryostat, which I've tried to kind of illustrate here. And so putting the, the capacitors outside the cryostat has the advantage of not having these variable capacitors um, needing to be cryogenically rated. So they don't need to be able to tune at cryogenic temperatures. Um, and additionally, you have more room outside the cryostat, so these capacitors can be bigger and they can handle more power. Um, however, uh, if we put a coaxial cable like this between our tuning and matching elements and our sample coil, um, the inductance and capacitance that of the coaxial cable will be added to our resonance circuit. Um, and this could potentially decrease our circuit filling factor. Um, Additionally, for, um, for correct tuning to be achieved with these, uh, with this kind of top setup here, uh, 
um, generally, um, you want to have this uh, this coaxial uh, length be about um, uh, integer of a wavelength over two. So basically, integer of a half wavelength of the frequency of interest that you're using, um, which can be inconvenient if you have to make it a certain length, depending on the actual length of your probe. Um, Furthermore, these coaxial cables also have resistances and they also have Q factors. And so um, if you add these into the resonance circuit, they can potentially decrease the Q of your circuit, which will affect both your B1 and your, and your signal to noise. Um, and so the other option is down here is to put the tuning and matching elements right next to your sample coil inside the cryostat. Um, and so, if we do this, we can eliminate the um, the inductance of the cry of the coaxial cable from our resonance circuit, and we also eliminate the resistance of this co of this coaxial cable from our resonance circuit. So this means we have higher Q um, and a higher filling factor. Additionally, this uh, this coaxial cable can be kind of any length we want it to be, um, and this kind of gives us a, high, a higher tuning range um, as well as just being more convenient for. Um, more convenient uh, for building just a probe of an arbitrary length. Um, one, one final thing I will note is that um, generally, if you have this top, if you put your um, tuning elements outside of your cryostat, you want to use a, um, a bigger coaxial cable that has less resistance. Um, but that can actually hurt you in a cryostat because it can conduct heat into the cryostat better if these coaxial cables are bigger and that can damage the um, minimum temperature that you can get to. And so for these reasons, we kind of chose this bottom option here, this um, locally tuned, I guess, circuit where the tuning elements are right next to our sample coil. Um, so the next decision we faced when selecting a double resonance circuit is whether to use a cross coil sample coil or a doubly tuned single coil configuration. Um, the cross coil configuration is essentially two coils that are oriented 90 degrees from each other to, uh, and it's basically one coil for each nuclei. Um, the advantage of this configuration is that each one of these, um, each one of these coils is essentially part of a single resonance circuit as kind of tried to show here. Um, and so basically because they're single resonance circuits, the circuit filling factor can be really high because you don't have to split it between two channels. Um, however, uh, this configuration in this configuration, typically one of the coils is outside of the other one. And so this will lead to a lower uh, sample filling factor um, for the outer coil. Uh, the other option is to, is to doubly tune a single coil. And um, this will have a lower circuit filling factor because the um, because you have an auxiliary, at least one other auxiliary coil needed to doubly tune it. However, the, uh, the sample filling factor will be high for both channels. Um, additionally, the, um, the B1 profile within the sample coil itself um, will be the same for both channels because the, the B1 is being generated by the same exact coil for both channels. And so one advantage this can have is that uh, the cross polarization mashing condition will be the same for all parts of the sample. Um, and so your, your cross polarization or CP experiments will be more efficient. And so for these reasons, we decided to pursue a circuit like this where we doubly tune a single coil. Uh, and almost, almost there, but I promise. But the final thing we kind of had to decide between was whether to uh, use inductive or, a cap or a capacitive coupling um, into our resonant circuit. And so uh, most, probe, most NMR probes use capacitive coupling to the resonant circuit, which like in the simplest form can look something like this. And so in this, um, the RF energy is, is coupled into the resonant circuit use, using the electric field of the capacitor here. Um, but the other option is to inductively couple our RF energy into the resonant circuit um, through the magnetic field of two uh, magnetically coupled inductors, which are these two things here. And so this provides a number of advantages, including the fact that the, the actual resonant circuit, which is basically just this inductor and capacitor here, is balanced. Um, and there are no, um, which can, if you have an unbalanced circuit, you can have some weird voltage distributions in your circuit that lead to undesirable effects. 
Um, additionally, there's no lead wires to ground here. And those lead wires to ground could potentially add extra inductance, which could dilute your circuit filling factor and affect the Q factor of your circuit. So for these reasons, we chose to use the inductive coupling circuit here. And um, if you wanna know more about kind of coupling and matching, um, Dr. Mark Conradi gave a really good talk also in this, um, in this uh, seminar. And I think that's also on the YouTube channel and where he goes and explains how matching works in detail. Um, that's a really cool talk I would recommend as well. Um, so, uh, now that we kind of faced all these choices and we made our made our decision on on each of them, uh, we chose the circuit that uh, design that we ended up choosing choosing is this one here, which uh, was designed by a uh, Toby Zenz. And so this circuit here is uh, locally tuned, um, which means that it's tuned not outside the cryostats. Uh, it uses a single it's a single coil, which is doubly tuned, and it um, is inductively coupled. And so this gives the circuit the advantage of being symmetric and balanced and having a wide tuning range as well, uh, and having a large filling, circuit filling factor. And so the reason why the circuit has a large filling factor, circuit filling factor is because um, these two inductors here in the resonance circuit um, only count as one inductor because they're symmetric with each other. So basically that means that there's no extra resonance. There's only two resonances in this circuit and so there's no extra spurious resonances that will dilute our circuit filling factor. And so next, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the components we used to build this circuit. So now that we know kind of what the circuit looks like, we need to choose how, how to build it. So probably the most important component of an NMR circuit is the uh, sample coil. And so um, most, most solid, solid state NMR probes use uh, solenoids like this as the sample coil due to the high Q factor that these provide, and they generally provide a really good sample filling factor. Um, however, it turns out that the axis of the solenoid needs to be perpendicular to the main magnetic field. Um, however, in most high field EPR setups, the microwaves are um, coupled to the sample parallel to the main magnetic field. So they'd essentially have to travel through the windings of this coil. Um, to reach our sample, and there's been a lot of uh, there's been a lot of work actually on trying to optimize solenoids for microwave transmission to the sample, but um, in general, it's still a little bit less efficient than not having a coil there at all. And so, for our probe, we decided to use um, this um, this saddle coil design here, which allows us to have um, axial irradiation of our microwaves, and our microwaves basically don't have to go through a coil; they can just go down the axis of our coil and not hit any wires or anything. Um, so the way we constructed this is basically with these two PTFE rings here um, with holes cut out in the pattern of the vertical rods of the saddle coil. And this technique was uh, taught to us again by, by Toby's ends. And so um, what we do is we essentially insert wires into these holes here. Um, the vertical rods of the solenoids, we insert those here. And then we make cross connections to actually form the windings of the saddle coil. And this actually works uh, pretty well. And so you can see an example of this uh, over here on the right. Um, additionally, we um, these PTFE rings are supported on a zirconia tube with these copper foil guard rings on the inside. And so these copper rings essentially uh, serve two purposes. One is that they concentrate the microwave or the, the, B1, the RF B1 field. Uh, into the center of the into the center of the um the coil, and the other is that they help guide the microwaves um, down the axis of this coil. Um, and so down here on the bottom, shown we we take it we took the Q factor and inductance of this coil just to make sure it fit our circuit. Uh, um, it fell within the values that were acceptable for our circuit, uh, and we additionally mapped out the uh, B1 homogeneity of this circuit using a ball shift measurement, which is essentially you measure the resonance, the resonance frequency of the circuit as a function of basically dipping a ball, a metal ball down this um, coil, and you'll actually see the resonance frequency shift, and that'll actually map out your, um, your B1 homogeneity. And so by doing this, we can kind of see what, 
what sample region, what height, what size of sample we can use while still having a fairly homogeneous um, B1 distribution in our sample. Um, so after the sample coil, the next most important components are the variable capacitors because they're responsible for tuning and matching the circuit to the correct resonance frequency. Um, so for our purposes, uh, these variable capacitors kind of have three requirements in general. They need to be able to still change capacitance at very low temperatures, like under 10 Kelvin, and they still need to be small enough so that multiple capacitors can be placed close to the sample coil in the cryostat. And they also need to withstand um, high voltages without arcing. Um, and so in a typical NMR probe, um, commercially available, you generally use commercially available capacitors. Um, however, in our, in our experience, we found, we found that these capacitors can become unreliable and jam up at very low temperatures, as well as being like really expensive. Um, although other people have reported success using these. So uh, it's just kind of our experience that we haven't been able to get them to work. Um, so for our probe, we found it convenient to build our own capacitors. Um, and so the capacitor design we chose um, consists of two pieces of copper foil that are kind of like here and here, which are wrapped around a dielectric tube, a dielectric ceramic tube. And so the copper foil pieces serve as essentially the two terminations of this capacitor. And the capacitance between these two um, copper foil pieces is varied by essentially inserting a metal piston into this uh, dielectric tube um, as shown here. Um, and so just one, one other thing I'll note about this type of capacitor, we've noticed that these capacitors tend to arc right on the surface of the inner metal piston, like right here. Um, no matter what the thickness of this dielectric um, tube is, um, or uh, what the material of the dielectric tube is. And this happens at pretty low, this initially happened at pretty low voltages. Um, and so to figure this out, we kind of simulated this capacitor geometry, which I've shown on the bottom here. And we found that the electric field is always the highest right on the surface of the metal piston. So you can kind of see we've mapped out the cutout of the electric field and it's always really high right on the surface there. And basically what can happen is that if there's a slight air gap here, that air or helium, for example, in our cryostat can get in. Um, this gas that can be here uh, can actually ionize due to this electric field and cause uh, a discharge or an arc. Um, and so to fix this problem, we simply uh, we put um, Teflon heat shrink over this inner metal piston, which uh, essentially excludes the gas directly um, from the surface of this inner metal piston and replaces it with Teflon, which is, has a very high resistance to arcing. Um, and so this gave us a much higher voltage handling. And so these, the capacitors that we ended up building can uh, handle about uh, one, one kilovolt, which is sufficient for our purposes. Additionally, because these capacitors are so simple, it's just kind of like a, like a rod going into a tube. Uh, they don't tend to jam up at these low temperatures. Um, and so the last, the last component that we need for this uh, circuit is the auxiliary coils. And so these components are important in a double resonance circuit because they determine the uh, circuit filling factor as well as affecting the overall Q factor of the circuit. So in the case of the inductively coupled double resonance circuit, the inductance of the auxiliary coils can be used to tune the ratio of the circuit filling factor between the H and the X channel. And so I've kind of tried to illustrate that here. Um, so higher inductances for the auxiliary coil will lead to higher proton channel efficiency, where lower values of inductance will lead to higher X channel efficiency and, and vice versa. And so um, we kind of wanted to maximize the, um, the X channel efficiency of our coil. So we used a pretty low value inductance for, um, for our inductors. And we wound it out of a pretty thick copper wire so that the Q was uh, sufficiently high. And so uh, when we put all these components together, we look something, we get something that looks like uh, the circuit over here on the right. And so I've shown the completed circuit here. And then on the left, I've shown some, some performance metrics that we measured, um, including the, um, the nutation frequency for the proton and the carbon channel at 125 watts. So for the protons, we got about 50 kilohertz of B1 
Um, and for the carbon channel, we got, and for the X channel, which is measured for carbon, we got about 38.5 kilohertz. Um, additionally, we measured the, um, the max power that we can put in, which is about 125 watts for each channel, uh, maybe a little bit higher for the proton channel. And we also were able to measure the, the, the circuit filling factor, essentially, of both channels. Um, and so we found that because we use such a low value for auxiliary inductors, the proton channel efficiency was about 33%, whereas the X channel efficiency was about 63%, which is kind of what we were going for. So that's, that's nice. And also we measured the Q and the tuning range. And so the tuning range of this thing, which is about uh, 10 megahertz, which can cover a pretty decent range of nuclei, such as manganese, bromine, carbon-13, aluminum, vanadium, sodium, and some copper as well. Um, so that was the NMR side of things. I'll really quickly go over the EPR side, because um, I think I'm pretty, pretty, uh, going pretty long. But essentially, when you're choosing an EPR circuit, you generally have to choose between using a resonant circuit or a non-resonant circuit. And so the first three of um, the first three things here are basically different designs for resonant circuits for EPR. However, I did say at the beginning we wanted to have a broadband EPR probe because we like to do multi-frequency EPR radiation for those uh, Eldor experiments. And so we wanted to use a uh, non-resonant broadband EPR probe head for ours. So we selected a non-resonant um, probe, which has the, also the, has the advantage of having a much higher, um, being able to use a much higher sample volume. Um, so the EPR design of our probe is based around a uh, corrugated waveguide, like most high field probes, that accepts a Gaussian beam for our quasi optics. Um, this beam travels down the length of the waveguide, which is then tapered down to concentrate the, um, the beam of the microwave power. Um, however, when we taper this down, uh, as soon as the beam is launched from like a small, uh, small opening, it tends to diverge a lot more than if it's la uh, launched from a larger opening. So to prevent it from basically just like scattering everywhere as soon as it exits the waveguide, um, we use a, um, a Teflon waveguide rod to guide the beam into the middle of our RF coil. And this idea is similar to what uh, Kurt Zillman and Carol were working on. Um, they presented that on, at the RMC a few years ago, but I, I don't think they've published it yet. But um, I think I do want to give them credit. I think it was their idea initially. And so um, this Teflon waveguide can also double as a sample cup. And it's constructed out of a PFA, which is kind of just essentially another type of Teflon. A PFA tube with uh, Teflon inserts um, to hold the sample in place, as shown over here. Um, on the um, on the right here. Um, well, additionally, we place kind of an aluminum mirror behind the sample, so the microwaves are reflected through the sample twice, which kind of gives this thing a nominal Q factor of uh, two. And so, a simulation of the microwave beam is shown over here on the right, and we can kind of see that most of the microwave power it does in fact stay inside of this um, Teflon waveguide, ideally, and is not diffracted out as soon as it exits the um, the corrugated waveguide. So um, we also did a bunch of uh, simulations to try to optimize this geometry um, to maximize essentially the B1 that our, um, that our electrons in our sample can feel. So on the left-hand side, we basically have an optimization of um, how, how big this, um, this Teflon waveguide, or how, how big in diameter this um, Teflon rod has to be. Um, and so you can see that for smaller di diameters, we can actually squeeze our microwaves. Uh, we can more densely pack our microwaves and get a higher B1, essentially. And so on the right-hand side, um, uh, we've optimized kind of the gap between our Teflon waveguide rod and the dielectric tube that's supporting our uh, RF coil. And so we did this to basically minimize leakage from um, from this Teflon waveguide rod into the surrounding uh, RF circuit. Um, so we did those optimizations. And here's basically just some, some, uh, some data we were able to get. Um, so uh, over here on the left, we basically did a 40 millimolar sample of four amino tempo at 30 Kelvin. And so um, we were able to do experiments such as um, EPR frequency profiles, EPR field, pro e EPR field sweep profiles, those Eldor experiments I was talking at, where you kind of choose one, one frequency to detect, and then you excite at multiple different frequencies. Um, we're also be able to do DNP experiments. So this is uh, down here, a DNP frequency profile. Um, we were also able to 
kind of calculate DNP enhancements we can get for various radicals as well, as shown here. Um, and we can measure directly the, um, the EPR B1 power that our sample is feeling, which is um, useful not only for EPR experiments, but also for kind of DNP experiments and simulations. And um, over here on the right-hand side, I've kind of shown some ex uh, experiments for, that we've done at Tritle at very low temperatures, so 8.5 Kelvin. So this is the EPR profile of a, a clustered tridal radical. And so you can see that it's kind of, this line shape is distorted because it's clustering with itself. And we took the, basically the electron T1 relaxations at different points in this EPR line. We can see that it's different at different points. And so um, I guess with that, I'll kind of go just end my talk. Um, I want to thank all the people who helped work on this probe, as well as everyone who taught me everything I know about EPR and NMR instrumentation. So uh, I especially want to thank Dr. Toby Zenz for over the last like year and a half teaching me how RF circuits work, as well as um, Professor Ilya Kaminker for teaching me about a lot of microwave stuff. And he used to be a postdoc in our lab. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Seif Ekbal, who um, used to be in our lab as well, was a postdoc, and he helped me out immensely with understanding um, NMR and DNP spin physics, and has provided a lot of good stimulating conversations about uh, instrumentation as well. And he also convinced me to do this talk. So if you really hated this talk, you can like send him an email or something, uh, blame him. Um, I also wanna uh, thank uh, Raymond Thicklin, uh, Miranda Lee and Raj in, our, in my lab, who helped out with the development of the probe and just um, with other stuff around the lab in general. Uh, Dr. Elisa Leavesley, who's at, I think, Thomas Keating now, who helped me when I first came to grad school understand DNP instrumentation and still gives me advice sometimes. Uh, Dr. Alicia Lund, who taught me how to do DNP experiments when I first came to grad school as well. Um, Dr. Tingan Sia, who has uh, also been giving me good advice on NMR instrumentation. And Dr. Thorsten Malley from Bridge 12, who has always answered my questions about DNP instrumentation and given me some good advice. And finally, last but not least, my advisor, Professor Songi Han, has, who has helped and supported me through my entire grad school career. And I really can't say enough good things about her, um, but she's been a great advisor. And also the entire Han lab, which I've shown in the bottom left. And uh, I guess that's it, that I end my talk there. Yeah. Thank you very much, Khan, uh, for that excellent talk. Uh, for uh, for, I'm sure for most uh, of the audience here and also for all of those uh, practical NMR spectroscopists, um, it was really insightful to kind of look into the different components in a really detailed and rigorous manner. And I'm sure I for one will be uh, going back to this talk to try and think about uh, some of the different components uh, uh, a lot more in detail. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, so I, maybe I, I'd like to request the audience to uh, post your questions in the Q&A window. So uh, we have a question uh, from Mart Millen. How short are the microwave pulses that you can generate? Um, so for a 90, a, how, so um, for, for our 90, so basically for an EPR 90 degree pulse, um, the shortest we generally get is about 500 nanoseconds. Um, but in terms of the limit of the hardware, the shortest pulse that we can actually generate is somewhere around 10 nanoseconds. Um, but this won't really do anything for us because the 90 because we don't have strong enough microwaves, really. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And I hope uh, that answered uh, Mart's question. I think I was also kind of curious on a related note. Um, maybe you mentioned this and I think I missed it. Uh, what's the highest uh, B1 field you're able to achieve uh, for the for EPR? For EPR, it's so it's. If our, our 90 pulse is about 500 nanoseconds, so it's like okay. one over four times that. So it's about, um, I don't know off the top of my head, but okay. No. Yeah, it's, it's related to the 90 time, the, the 500 nanosecond Got 90 it. time. Got it. Uh, maybe as we are waiting uh, for others to uh, post some of their questions, I think the talk has been so detailed that everybody is 100% clear on these topics. Um, yeah, Mark has a question. What about for EPR detection under MAS? 
Um, well, so it's it's definitely possible. I know Kurt Zilm had done CW EPR under for MAS um, before. Um, I don't think anyone's done post EPR under MAS yet. Um, one of the main difficulties for that is getting the microwaves through um, through the sample coil, essentially. Um, so basically, getting it because in most most MAS setups have this um, this solenoid sample coil here. And so um, most of the challenge is getting the microwaves through the sample coil and then detecting the microwaves that come out of the sample coil. Um, so in EPR, pulse EPR, the, the detection that we use is called induction mode detection. And so essentially you put uh, your excitation pulse is, um, the polarization of your excitation pulse beam is 90 degrees phase shifted from your detection pulse beam. And so, with a with a coil like this, it's um, it's easy to put one polarization in, and which the, where the polar the electric field polarization is going perpendicular to the kind of the the axis of the solenoid, but then getting the induction mode um, polarization out is a lot harder because it will basically hit the windings of these solenoids. So it's that's just one of the challenges is just getting it through the coil, um, but it's definitely possible. Um, if you had enough sensitivity, you could definitely do it. I think a few years ago, um, I um, kind of had uh, heard about some conversations uh, with uh, Torsten Malley, uh, where uh, they uh, they were kind of thinking about uh, doing EPR detection uh, with the standard Bruker probes by just kind of inserting a coil from the top so that the coil would like sit like right above the NMR sample. I don't know about uh, some sort of idea like that. Can you can you kind of comment on uh, whether how efficient uh, would that be for EPR detection? Um, so I mean that would be yeah. So if your sample coil was just kind of outside, was not like covering your sample, you would you would yeah that would optimize whatever um, EPR detection you could do. But you you would sacrifice a lot on the NMR detection. Um, so, I mean, you could, if you wanted to do just EPR under MAS, you could do, you could just get rid of this coil altogether and just spin your rotor and then detect it that way. Um, but a, a big part of the reason why you'd want to do EPR under MAS, at least the, what, what I think is that um, you'd be able to measure the EPR mutation frequency exactly and that the sample experiences. And so um, if you have a coil there, that's going to change the, um, the EPR mutation frequency that you have. So it's so you wouldn't be able to d measure directly how much microwave power your sample is, is feeling. So, but yeah, I mean, it still give you a lot of valuable insights. Like what are the electrons doing during, during the spinning? Yeah. Thank you. That makes sense. Uh, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Can this design be implemented at 14 Tesla? Um, I'm guessing they mean the, um, the NMR design. Or just I, the whole thing. I, um, maybe they mean uh, both. Yeah. So sure. on the EPR side, definitely. Um, the the one problem on the EPR side is that these amplifier multiplier chains get weaker and weaker as you go up to fourteen Tesla. But they do have them at fourteen Tesla, and there has been high field EPR detection at, at fourteen Tesla. Um, for this, um, for the NMR side, yeah, I would say yes. It it becomes a little bit more difficult because. Um, I forget what frequency that is, but it is a higher frequency. So you have to be more careful when designing your um, when designing your NMR probe here because you have to take into account every single um, like lead length here, like all the lead lengths and everything. You have to be really careful about, and your inductors are going to be a lot smaller too. So, um, but yeah, people people build NMR circuits at at that frequency. So I would say it's definitely possible. Right. We have a question from uh, Marcel Levian. How much does the Teflon guiding piece improve your B1 of the EPR? Um, so it basically, it doesn't, so it, um, let's see if I can find this. So essentially it doesn't necessarily improve the B1 of our EPR, but it, it does help. It does. It is helpful in shifting our sample sample volume away from the waveguide here. So, if you were just concerned with EPR, you would actually want to put your sample kind of inside the waveguide 
or right at the output of the waveguide um, and then put like a mirror behind it. But we're also concerned with NMR, so we need to have this coil around it. And so this coil, the RF fields generated by this coil can't penetrate inside the waveguide. So it has to be kind of outside the waveguide. And so the reason why we use these Teflon things is to basically bring our microwaves from this thing down into the, um, into the um, sample, which is in the middle of our RF coil. And so um, in terms of, it doesn't make it better than if we had it inside the coil, inside the, um, inside the uh, corrugated waveguide, but it does make it better than if we, if we didn't have this thing, then we'd actually get a lot of diffraction of microwaves out of here. And so I think I kind of tried this. So our, our, current, our current maximum 90 time is like 500 nanoseconds. And um, if, you, if we just have a, if we don't have this kind of this structure here, I think our 90 time would be about 600 or 700 nanoseconds, um, if that kind of answers your question. Yeah, I think we have a related question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, why do you not use a focusing lens at the base of the waveguide to focus your microwaves onto the sample volume? Um, so that's actually an idea that's been used a lot in um, MAS, MAS DMP, um, they, where they use a focusing lens at the output of the waveguide to focus it onto your sample. Um, but here we don't actually need to use a focusing lens because all the microwaves will kind of basically be sucked into this Teflon thing because uh, we, there's really mi a minimal air gap between the output of this waveguide and this Teflon. And so um, we, don't, we don't really need a focusing lens in this scenario. Um, if anything, what we could do is we could have this Teflon piece. We can do something. We could probably put like a like a rounded thing on the top of this Teflon waveguide. And that might kind of act as like a focusing lens to help um, basically impedance match this microwave beam from the corrugated waveguide to our um, Teflon waveguide. And I've done some simulations of that and it, it does show it helps a little bit, but it doesn't help um, so much essentially. So it wouldn't help really noticeably if you're mostly concerned with DNP, um, but it might change your, your nutation frequency by like a few tens of nanoseconds or something. Uh, uh, there's another question. Can you use the sample holder as a microwave resonator? Um, yeah. So you, in theory, this structure, you could do this. And in some cases, when I messed this messed up building this, it actually did kind of act as a resonator. So basically a, that would kind of be equivalent to this, um, Fabry Perot resonance structure here where, um, Basically, you just have two mirrors, and one of the mirrors either has a, a small hole in it or is like not 100% a mirror. It can has like 1% transmission. And so the microwaves can kind of come through the small hole and then basically bounce around between these two mirrors, and that's your resonance structure. And so for our thing, we do have a mirror at the bottom. And so if we put kind of a mirror at the top here, we could, in theory, kind of bounce our microwaves between these two things in our over our sample. And that could be a resonance structure. But based on this design, it would be a kind of a really bad resonator. And for our purposes, since we want to do these multi-frequency irradiation experiments, we didn't want a resonator. Um, and another thing is that the resonators can be really annoying to tune as well. Um, because like for every frequency, you have to tune it. And so doing something like a um like a DNP frequency profile would end up taking a really long time because you'd have to tune your resonator for each one of these frequencies. I think we are uh, kind of uh, running out of questions now. Uh, maybe I can ask one final question. Have you had uh, some opportunities to try uh, pulse DNP experiments? Um, so yes, we've tried it. Um, so a lot of the interesting DNP experiments we can do are related to the AWG and the IQ mixer because we can have this frequency and phase control where we can fat, like quickly modulate the, the frequency over the, um, the DNP excitation. But in terms of pulse DNP, we don't really have enough power. To, in terms of like pulse DNP as compared to like pulse EPR or NMR, we don't really have enough microwave power to like coherently drive the, um, basically drive the coherences of our spins to do kind of maybe what Bob Griffin would call pulse DNP. So we basically do saturation DNP, where we mainly just saturate our spins, but 
we can do cool stuff with the AWG to saturate our spins in different ways to, um, yeah, to increase our DFP enhancement.